welcome um, to our Montessori Musings uh, webinar for November. We are delighted to be able to focus on sustainability because we feel it is a very essential part of our Montessori work. For us, sustainability is very closely linked with our understanding of our cosmic education and of our cosmic task. For us, cosmic education is not only focused on the elementary curriculum, it is very much a value which underpins everything that we do in Montessori settings, because after all, we are all promoting universal peace within our environments, and we want the children from the very beginning to be aware of their importance in global citizenship. We want them to be aware of the interdependence of all the species and of our responsibility for the planet, because what we do today will affect what happens in the future. Uh, for tonight's session, we have invited three colleagues who have dedicated their interests and energy to promoting sustainability in their settings. And we are looking at different stages of this commitment. Um, the Hummingbird Montessori in London are relatively new setting, but they have on the outset committed um, in their publicity to the fact that they want to promote care of the environment, they want to promote sustainable practices. So Lena will share with us um, what they do. We are delighted to have um, Shalisa with us all the way from Toronto. She has worked with the youngest children in the Jewish Montessori School in Toronto for several years. And she was part of the Earth Project, which grew out of Montessori everywhere and was uh, kind of promoted by um, by Simone Davies, but Shalisa has got energy and commitment, which is just wonderful to share in because I hope that she will inspire you to wanting to share some of these ideas uh, with um, your community. And then we will, uh, we are very grateful to Sarah Johnson uh, from Norwich Montessori in East Anglia of sharing her work on the OMEP UK Sustainable Citizenship Project, which is a well-structured program of how to grow children's awareness um, through the environment, through working with the community, and also looking at some of the um, issues which relate to uh, sustainability, like economic well-being. Uh, we are eternally grateful to Kanit, uh, Kavita, who so kindly put together the blog for tonight's session. If you have not had time to read it yet, please, please do that. Kavita takes us on a personal journey and shares some of her deep commitment to the environment and to the importance of our engagement with the environment. She has been a huge inspiration um, to tonight's session. So thank you all. Um, Lena's presentation is pre-recorded and we will share in her presentation and then we will go on to Shalisa. So thank you again for joining us. And as usual, please stay muted until we have received, we have had the presentations. We will also after the presentations share some questions about engaging stakeholders. And then as usual, we will break into sessions so that we can discuss what it really means to us as practitioners. Hello, I'm Lenaik from Hummingbirds Montessori School and I've been asked by Barbara and Wendelin to talk a little bit about our project around sustainability. So for a little bit of context, we opened the nursery three years ago and we had in mind that uh, we needed to do something around green education, sustainable education um, with the children. Um, so 
why we decided to do this, I think one of the big questions for Montessorian is to think, okay, so if Maria Montessori was alive today, what would she do? And we really think that she would be involved in uh, the fight against climate change um, and that she she would advise to do something uh, in the early years um, um, related to sustainability. Obviously, we can't really answer that question for sure. This this is just um, this is just what we think she would do based on what we know uh, of her personality, um, and also doing acting, doing something around sustainability is also following the cosmic education uh, philosophy curriculum. Uh, because if we tell the children and if we think that everything is interconnected, uh, then we have to measure the impact we have on other beings and on the environment and try to change things step by step um, so, so that we are um, good, role model, good role models for the children. Um, and also for us, because none of us, so we, none of us in our team is really expert on sustainability. No one is like an eco warrior or anything. So it's um, also an occasion to kind of ask ourselves important questions such as how do we want to live in this world? Uh, what can we change? Um, and how do we feel responsible for um, our actions um, and the impact we have on the environment when we think about educating a new generation who is going to grow in this world and inherit um, the consequences of uh, our action. So that's more for the philosophical side. And a uh, practical side of things, um, we do um, various different things. So we first we have a free flow um, between the indoor space and the outdoor space and a really big garden. So that's one of our strengths really. And and the without us doing anything, the children already connected to nature. Um, and we try to integrate whatever is happening outside um, in the in the classroom. So seasons, if they've spotted an animal, uh, we're going to put an activity related to that animal on the shelf, etc. So um, nothing really groundbreaking. Um, we do uh, gardening activities. So we have a little veggie patch. Um, we have a wormery, so it's really interesting to see how children, um, quite often when they first arrive, their first reaction when they see the worms is to say, ah, yuck. Um, and this is interesting because this, this is obviously a learned behavior uh, that goes away quite quickly because they are invited to, they, they are invited to feed the worms with the scraps from uh the snack preparation area and uh and like we tell them that they can give the worms names uh and and quite quickly they accept to like hold them in their hands so the wormery is a good tool to connect the children to uh to nature and to learn that um it's it's not it's not yucky it's just it looks a little bit gooey but it's not yucky um and same with contact with the soil so we don't have a sand pit we have a soil pit instead uh and uh children absolutely love it they uh use it in the mud kitchen they use it with they dig they find worms as well they mix it with water um and we also have a water butt, uh, which is something I would really advise any setting to have if there is space for it, because it saves so much water. 
uh, and the children can use it independently. They absolutely love it. It's they 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 fill bucket of water and 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 just carry them around the garden. Use them for their mud soup. So that's another like practical idea that uh, has that we have implemented that kind of has sprung a lot of play ideas um and then it's uh great to talk about the cycle of water because obviously the the the, the water but is connected to um to the spout and the and the roof and then we can talk about like what happens when it's not raining for a few days and it's empty etc etc so gardening composting warmery water but um these are all things that are um, really helpful to um, to implement like real actions, and they are really they are not difficult to implement. Um, and it kind of closes the cycle as well because the wormery and the compost are fed by the scraps from the snack area. Um, so the children prepare their own snack. Uh, the vegetables come from a company called River Forge, uh, who some of you might know, who are um, re uh, resourcing their vegetables from uh, mainly British farms, and they're organic. Uh, so then these scraps can be used uh, in the compost and in the wormery. And uh, we also use leaves from the garden um, in the compost. So the children really enjoy doing uh, these type of activities. Um, other things that we are trying to do, we are trying to apply the three R rules, reduce, reuse, recycle. So mainly in the art area, for instance, we source things from a scrap store i don't know if there's one near your settings but it's absolutely brilliant usually um you just need to pay for a yearly membership um they're not expensive and uh you just um go there and these are all resources that uh were going to be uh thrown in the bin but instead they've been uh classified and tidied by uh volunteers and um, settings can just help themselves. Uh, so these are this is this is this has been really helpful. We also whenever we need something for a specific art art activity, we also put a um, treasure box out um, at pick up and drop off, and the parents are asked to bring. Um, for instance, it can be like empty egg boxes, things like this. Uh, we also try to think about a uh, thing that we could replace by, by uh, more uh, by versions that are more respectful towards the environment, such as um, compostable nappy bags. Uh, we use bee wraps, for instance, uh, if like there's um, there's something that needs to go in the fridge that's going to be used the next day. Then instead of using cling film. We use or Tupperware that are reusable or uh, be wrap. Um, like most of res the resources we use in the office, like the folders, etc. They are secondhand, come from the scrap store. Um, so, yeah, so we are trying to think also in the way we manage like what can be replaced by either something that's reused either something that's uh, more respectful to the environment um, we also try to source uh, activities and toys uh, from facebook markets or vintage uh, or maybe parents that don't need it anymore um, so that's the kind of uh, reuse reduce recycle aspect um, then there's also a project with the projects with the community uh, that is uh, there's one that's led by my colleague uh, Grace um, 
who is going to talk more about it uh, if she's able to. Otherwise, I'll, I'll, I'll try to explain as, as much as I can. But it's, it's, it's lovely and the children have been enjoying it very much. Um, and then I feel that we were t I was talking about the cosmic education, but like one of the other aspects where I really feel that um, a sustainable approach is com naturally part of the Montessori uh, philosophy and education is uh, care of the environment. Um, it kind of goes hand, hand in hand, like there's not really a distinction between caring for the classroom, caring for the plants in the classroom, uh, like and also grace and courtesy, being kind to um, to being respectful. Um, like there's not really a distinction with caring for um, the, the insects that we find in the garden. Uh, being respectful of what we find outdoors, um, uh, like uh, tidying up the rubbish that we find in the garden, etc., etc. And we can see um, some of the children already come with this, and some of the children change. Uh, they they can some of them come and they would uh, step on ants. Uh, um, or through snails, we had that one time, and then uh, just by telling them, oh, you know, this is um, this this is an insect, this is an animal, uh, like maybe they have a family, da, 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 and try to kind of make them connect with um, with other beings that they might find um, in the garden, and uh, it's always. Uh, quickly successful and children then um, instead of not like innocently harming a bug they are going to decide to make them a house for instance um, or just observe them so yes so care of the, the environment and and grace and courtesy and the values that we um transmit to the children lovely thank you very much uh, lena uh, demonstrating how very small things um, can make a big change um, in developing positive attitudes in children for caring of the environment and how important it is for the adults environment to be um, role models and to really think about small little details like how you store things, how you use, um, recycle everything that you have in the environment. So thanks very much. Um, now we hand over to um, Shalisa in Toronto and uh, we are excited to hear about your contribution to the Earth Project, which was initiated by um, Simon Davies of Montessori Everywhere. Good evening, everybody. Um, it's still afternoon. I tried to find a spot where you could kind of see the sunlight coming through a little bit where I am. Um, I'm so happy to be here with everyone and to share the experiences I've had at uh, the school I've been with. As Barbara said, I have been at Montessori Jewish Day School for 14 years. Um, and, and it's been such an amazing experience learning from the children, watching them grow and experience in their classrooms, in their classroom environment, outdoors. Um, and as Barbara had mentioned, um, I was a part of the Earth Project led by Simone and Barbara. And there's a handful of you that are on the call that were a part of our collaborative team, which was such a great experience having people around the world, like-minded, who wanted to share ideas about sustainability, regeneration, and sharing that with their classrooms, with their homeschools, and individuals who were interested in taking part in a larger picture project in a global sense. And I think it was such an amazing experience that we were able to collaborate in small projects, in small little things, and in medium-sized things, and trying to have a bigger picture, and including the community and parents, and creating stewardship with everybody. So everybody in that project were able to do what they were capable of doing. 
anything we're taking on, even when we're talking about sustainability and regeneration now, you have to feel successful in what you're doing. So I have a few slides um, that what we do at our school. Um, and it kind of goes with what, so what, and now what? So I'm just gonna share, bear with me. I haven't shared slides in a long time. So let's just see if I can do it. Here we go. And I'll start the slide show. Can everyone see this? Good, thank you. Okay, so again, if you guys wanna get in touch with me, you can contact uh, Montessori Musings. They have my details, but if you need it, it's here. So this is a little photo of our school on a beautiful autumn day with the sun shining. And right over here is a playground that the children get to play in and they absolutely love it. The approach that we take, let me move this little bit so you can see. Um, why is this important? Why is sustainability important for us on the level as an educator, as a parent, and for the children? So the approach that we like to take is awareness, interconnectedness, and responsibility. So a breakdown of the awareness would be, I love, and Rahina, who's on the call knows, I love this bright shining eyes. When you see a child captivated with something in nature, you know you've got them. They're intrigued at something. They have an emotional connection. It can also be a wow moment or aha moment. Last week was our first snowfall and just seeing the children be so excited about being in the snow, sticking their face up and capturing those snowflakes for the very first time for some of them because they've never experienced snow before if they've moved from um, a warmer climate. And those moments, we try and move it into interconnectedness. Like how do we extend that moment into a lesson? How can we help support and facilitate them connect to their world um, within their classroom environment? And then it becomes their responsibility and that natural progression to take care of the earth. So I really think it really is important for awareness is having those individual moments and pockets of opportunity of joy and love for earth. And then it transitions so smoothly for responsibility of like, what can we do next? And again, having them become the stewards of the earth makes a huge difference in what parents are willing to do because if they excite excitement with their children, they're going to want to do it too. So some of the things of how we engage colleagues, parents with projects. So we get outside quite a bit. We talk about the environment. We always go on nature walks. And with us, the beauty of having all the seasons, we go in the same area um, every season to see the growth and the change. And we have this one bush by the school that's called a burning bush. And the children love to see when there's little buds, they see when the leaves are green. And then when it becomes this fire, fluorescent almost color. The excitement they have of going through and traveling through is so captivated to see that they can actually see the progression and change. Um, and we try and use our senses. Like we stop and pause and we play the silence game as we're on our walk. And we talk about what can you smell? What can you hear? And what can you touch? And we don't do a lot of tasting on our nature walks, but <laughs> there are a lot of other senses that we could do and we discuss that. So as you can see, we have a few things with walking in the snow. We have some older children who are journaling in um, a park that's close to us. Again, this capturing this moment of capturing a snowflake on your tongue is just the most brilliant moment and so exciting when they come and tell you that they've captured the snowflake and taking care of their classroom environment as well. And there is, so we've broken it down as the individual and the interconnectedness I've connected with the classroom. So things that they can do like creating artwork, but discussing that the artwork you're creating is going to stay in nature. Um, this upper um, picture right here with the bin is our vermicompost. Um, the older children in upper elementary uh, lead this and they come to each classroom. We all have our own bins and they come and they take care and the younger children are always so delighted to be a part of that and see um, how the children are taking care of it as well as um, having a full circled loop where the castings that they are taking and removing from the worm bin 
uh, is used to help winterize our plants. So the castings are mixed with water and that water is put into the plants for the winter time to help nutri like give nutrients to the plants back. So the children are always seeing that and they're always excited to be a part of that and contribute exactly what the other school was doing, um, the hummingbird Montessori is that we do give them our snack scraps and they get to see the involvement of what the decomposition looks like. Um, and during uh, COVID times, we uh, had a classroom space outdoors and many opportunities. And this is again, creating, connecting nature with materials that we had in the classroom that were then outdoors as you can see, the smallest to biggest. And again, having that joy and love. And then um, what we've done is connected it with a school-wide approach within our community. So in this picture, not this one, this, no. hang on one moment, let me get back there. Here in this bottom picture here, we have done a collaboration with an outdoor educator. For us, for us we've uh, connected with a, a group called Shoresh, which is like a Jewish outdoor educational uh, institution. And what's amazing, if you have an opportunity to connect with someone in your local area that is knowledge knowledgeable about your ecosystem, they have a wealth of knowledge that can help spread knowledge of things that you may not know about, and they can help support you. And going to the parks that are close to you and talking about the ecosystem and really expanding the sense of place and giving them that awe of wonder, um, which I think is such a lovely experience. Like we had just experienced it maybe two weeks ago and they talked about the habitat and different animals that live in our specific area and what type of habitat they would need for the winter and how we could create it for them or if we could find it and going exploring and seeing what could be done. Um, I think that's really lovely in how the children can contribute. On a larger school community um, base, what we've done is we do a lot of things with programming of recycling our cardboard and doing a program called Goose Paper, where we take any paper that maybe if someone photocopy too many pieces of paper or there's things that they can, the back of the paper is still good, but the front has been used. We use that paper for our artwork. If we are cutting snippets, that goes into the collage work. So trying to use as much as we can without throwing it away. So again, kind of connecting to the reduce, reuse and recycle, but also rethinking. What can we do in a bigger picture? So our community events, we really encourage parents and community members to bring um, their own canteens for drinking tea or coffee or water. And I think that helps them understand where our goals are and what we want to do. So I wanted to show you a few things what we do as a community school wide. We have a gardens that are taken care of by the children. So we have some older children here um, collecting herbs and we have a CASA class that is drawing the herbs and filling up sachet bags for Havdalah, which is a ceremony in the Jewish tradition where you are smelling essential herbs um, for the end of Shabbat. Another thing that we did as a, a project during actually the Earth Project was uh, creating a Hanukkah uh, around Hanukkah time that was represented, um, presented to the Israeli Consulate of Canada, where we collected all of these recyclable uh, things and nature um, and created from each step, the toddlers to casas. So they kind of built the base of everything. And then the older children created, elaborated and created the structure up to middle school. And then they painted it and changed it. So everyone was involved in the ability that they were involved in. And it was such a huge community feel. I'm just gonna stop sharing. It was such a huge community feel and it really tied everyone together. And I find when you get the child involved and when you ask parents for a quick request or a quick something that is easy and they're capable of doing, if you're not asking too much of them, they're so willing to do it. And if they're going to see something later on like that Hanukkah, it's very exciting that they're like, I contributed a small thing to that, help my child have joy in creating something and making it bigger. Um, 
those are the few things I just really think just going over the awareness, the interconnectedness, as, as Barbara was saying about interdependence, that is, is huge. And that really connects and gets them really to absorb the responsibility of what they want to do. And those bright shining eyes, it's just so, it's so motivating to see and to continue the work that we do. Doesn't matter how small you start small, you can do something big, you can collaborate with another classroom. There's so many ideas and options of what you can do. And everything that you do will make an impact, right? Don't get overwhelmed. I think that's really the key is like, if you get overwhelmed, then you're like, oh, I can't, you can't do it. And really another thing that we talked about in the Earth Project is not having it start from the top down, actually having the kids excited about something and helping facilitate their excitement. And that really gets the ball rolling. If it's always coming down from the adult level going downwards, it's not going to be as exciting and it's not gonna be as motivating to them. And as soon as they see something that they would love to do and they run with it and you just help guide them, support them, make sure there's books available for them or have the older kids come and talk to them about it. It really makes the braiding of all of those things together really nice and having creating an environment like our classroom, but in the school community, in our playground, in our walk, having that environment of in, independence for their exploration. I think that's all I have to say, <laughs> sorry. Oh, thank you so much, Alisa, giving us a glimpse at your important work and giving us inspiration of what is possible and introducing us to some important language which will be helpful to you when uh, sharing information with the children, like your idea of uh, reduce, reuse, reuse, and recycle, and of course, regenerate that idea that there is a continuum and how it impacts long term is very, very important. And I also loved your term of stewardship of the earth or stewardship of the environment. It suddenly gives it an importance which the children can to can take to heart and they very much feel that they are doing important work and that leads us very beautifully to Sarah's presentation because um, her important work has followed a specific framework gives her an opportunity to progress and also gives some of the purpose of the nursery to be expressed through a wider project. So, um, Wendelin, if we could please have um, Sarah's presentation. Last year, we completed the Bronze OMEP Sustainability Award. The award enabled us as a small Montessori school in Norwich to be part of a global effort to address climate change and the future for the children in our care. Our school building is a parish hall and we have sole use of the premises. The parish is now quite isolated. A lot of the local farmland is now home to an NHS hospital, a private hospital, the University of East Anglia and the John Innes Science Park. There are no local shops or schools. Our school is our community and we do our best to explore the area around us. We want to help educate the children in our care about our planet and we do this on a daily basis with the materials on our shelves. We now want to also educate the children about the need to look after our planet, how to grow food, recycle, encourage zero waste, and to understand why we are doing this. The 2021 Montessori Europe Envisioning the Future Together conference enabled us to see what other schools are doing to address climate change around the world. Through the Montessori Musing webinars, in particular the Mirrors and Windows presentation, we were introduced to Hannah's Kahani's excellent sustainable school. We looked at the sustainable practices which already take place at our school and how we can extend and adapt what we do so that sustainability becomes an everyday feature. Our Montessori practice also enabled us to realise something we take for granted, Montessori philosophy. Inclusion and care for one another and the importance of looking after and appreciating our planet, acknowledging our history and evolution, reusing and caring for the equipment giving the children an understanding of how the seasons change throughout our lives. Maria Montessori has enabled us to take the sustainability next steps with ease. The Birthday Orbital Walk is a perfect introduction to children about the alignment of the planets and the changing seasons we experience every year. As the climate starts to change with longer, hotter summers, early autumns, wetter winters, 
causing global disasters affecting everyone around the world, we realise it, it is essential we educate the children in our care. The need to promote good, sustainable practice has to be part of our Montessori practice. In 20 years' time, the children will perhaps be completing their degrees or working. They may even be considering having children of their own. We can do our best to enable them to understand how important it is to be sustainable and care for others, to ingrain this into their thinking for the future. The OVET guidelines enable us to look at all aspects of our practice and combining it with emerging literacy and numeracy skills to relook at how we use what we have to promote diversity and inclusion. The Netbrook originally organised and led the OMEP Sustainability Award through her Schema Play initiative, introducing us to her work at the Connecting Montessori Europe webinar. We started the Bronze Award with help and support from Wendy Compson, who guided us through the process and encouraged us to recognise what we already do by completing the self-audit tool, and then how we can improve and promote that in the classroom. Wendy visited us and throughout the process, she was in herself an inspiration. We informed the parents via a letter and then had a Zoom meeting with ongoing support from Wendy to give parents more information about the Bronze Award and invite everyone to take part. The children and their parents were given an individual ICANN booklet covering literacy, numeracy, the environment, economic, social and cultural aspects of their lives. This also gave the parents the opportunity to reflect on how much they already do at home with regards to sustainability and what they can add to their child's life to continue their learning. When all the individual ICANN booklets were completed, the children were awarded their bronze passports in recognition of their hard work, which they were all very pleased to receive. It was a revelation to see how willing parents embrace the opportunity to share their religious and cultural celebrations. We had a wonderful Eid celebration. The parents organised a party in the garden and all the children and the other parents were invited to celebrate, eating cakes and dates, face paintings for the children, reading stories and everyone having the opportunity to try on religious clothing. We got together for gardening mornings, for jubilee celebrations, communal walks to raise money for charity and our nativity play. All these activities bringing our community together and giving the children further confidence to interact and share their thoughts, enabling them to understand why we need to take care of our environment and accepting each other's different approaches to life and embracing them. Since completing the Bronze Award, the COVID restrictions have been lifted and we are able once again to reinstate our Harvest Festival with the parents. This is an activity we feel exemplifies sustainability. The children prepare their vegetables for the soup, they make bread, wash tomatoes, cut cheese and butter and arrange flowers for the tables. Parents are then invited to come to lunch and eat what the children have prepared and share in a communal gathering raising money for a local children's charity. The garden has a mud kitchen, vegetable patches, shelves for activities, climbing and other outdoor equipment. The children are able to access the outdoor area throughout the morning and as a group in the afternoon. The garden is our most beneficial place for learning about climate change. The children are encouraged to share their thoughts on growth and why plants need the right conditions to grow. The children also harvest, count and cook the produce. Parents have come to the building for communal garden mornings, helping to dig it, plant, trim flowers and hedges and fix broken buildings. Recycling and reuse have always been an area of our practice which we have tried to promote. Having the opportunity to be sustainable through the OMEP award and being part of a global community, receiving support and guidance to do so, so seemed like a great opportunity and one we are very pleased we took. We look forward to completing the silver award, aiming to go zero neutral next term and encourage our children to lead the way as sustainable citizens.
Thank you very much, Sarah, sharing this very specific, specific framework um, and demonstrating how well it can be integrated within the whole areas of the curriculum. And I think that for us as practitioners, that is a very important aspect of really integrating all the work in everything that we do with the children in our classrooms. And that link uh, lead us to the question about what about the parents? How did you get them involved um, in your work? You mentioned it a little bit and there was lots of evidence in the pictures, but you know, did they really buy into your ideas? Did they really value what you were trying to do? Yeah, I, they did. I think um, we, we had some parents who were very keen already, um, very involved. We at the moment have a parent who's uh, vegan, she's a vlog blogger and she's, constantly she's really on hot which is really good and when you can get those parents involved and then the other parents come along it, it helps as as one of the other contributors saying if you get the children keen they encourage their parents to be involved and I think that um it worked it does work and I think fundamentally everyone's worried about the environment and everyone's worried about their children's future and they should be as as on board, I feel, as we are, because they are, they are the future and we do need to, it needs to be a way of thinking opposed to something we might dip into occasionally. It has to be part of everyday life. And, uh, and they were very good. Yeah, once they, we all had the Zoom and uh, that got everyone engaged initially. And I think also there is an element, there's a passports that the children do. So they feel those, they, there's part of that that they do at home. And I think that helps. Uh, a lot to just actually engage parents and the beauty of the scheme is that it 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 gives parents something to focus on um instead of thinking oh well the school will do all that but it actually includes the parents to come in and bring it into the community so I think it's a really good scheme and it, it really made us focus as well so yeah that's lovely thank you and of course the children play an important role in making that connection between the school and the parents if you give them little seeds of information they take it to the parents okay. and then it, it builds into um a something bigger which is really important what about you shalisa how do you feel your work is impacting the parents you obviously do lots of work within the community but what about the parents engagement i would have to agree with sarah that um, the parents are involved when we ask them for a little bit of things like we say we're doing a project and we need reusable materials they're very excited to contribute to something that is going to make their child happy and they want to be a part of the garden and again sometimes for the bigger things it's a little bit hard to get them to be present but if you're asking them to bring something into the classroom that their child can bring in they're a little bit easier to do that um, for our garden, um, we tried to initiate having parents come to the this, like to the place to help till and to prepare it for winter, and that was a little bit challenging. But then we realized, okay, so if we just ask them for something, we kind of backpedal a little bit of what we need them. But I find when it has to involve with their child and their child is excited about something, they're invested to make their child happy. Yeah, that and it, it it's that. Um, connection between the child and the family and that it's the triangle continues in different permutations yeah. and I also find connect sorry Barbara to cut you off but um one of the things I find at our school is we take a lot of photos and we use a platform to send photos to parents so when they see the thing that they brought or they see their child creating something or planting they're like oh look look what they're doing so it gets the parents excited so they know and they're a little bit more involved in seeing the inside of the happenings of the school and I think that gets them very excited to know what's going on and they're more supportive to help um, with the sustainability and the regeneration aspects that we request. Thank you so much and Lena maybe your um, colleague Grace would like to say a few words about taking um, this um, recycling work from the school to the community um, th then for extending um, the voice of the nursery into a, and making children aware that they are part of a community not just the little classroom. Grace maybe invite you to say a few words? 
Um, so basically, I was saying, so just going back a little bit, I was saying the first thing is introducing the parents to the school, see what kind of, of school we are, what their expectations or what our expectations are going to be uh, for the parents and the community. And then basically, um, then we do, um, uh, we explain to the children what we're going to do. We send an email to the parents to get them involved. And then the main thing, the third step and, and the main step is basically letting the children understand in a concrete way how all this works. And the way we do that is we, so we, we talk about um, how, uh, for example, we were, we were about to launch this project that was um, recycling bottle tops. So we started saying to the children, okay, well now, all these bottle, bottle tops are going to go on our gardens, on the field, on earth. And what is going to happen? All the animals are going to eat them. It's going to be harmful. It's going to be, uh, it's going to pollute. It's going, it's going to stay there and it's going to become um, trash and something that no, not a lot of people are going to <clears throat> um, clean if we don't do it. How, what do you think we can do? Do you think um, this is going to be food for the earth? And so, you know, we, so before the break, usually before launching the project, let's say in January, before we break for Christmas, we take the children out on the field and then we say, these are, this is metal, this is plastic, these are bottle tops. And here we have apple cores. What do you think it's going to happen with this? So we show this to the children and some of them say, yes, plastic is going to be food. By the time we come in January, it's going to be gone. Um, metal as well. Some of them, they, some of them say, no, 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 that is not going to go when we come back. When we come back, the apples will be gone. We put that under something heavy. And when we come back, we go and check that again. And so the children really see it and they see that the apple is gone, but the plastic is still there. The metal is still there. The paper is still there. By that time, we have gotten the parents involved by the email that we sent and they start their little collection of whatever it is that we are recycling. And so it starts with the little circle time where the children come, They uh, we do it once a week at circle time. And then we call the children that have, that have um, a little collection of whatever we are recycling. And so we make it a big thing. The, the child that has come with this pours it into a, um, a box and then we all clap and they, are, they just feel so proud about it. And then of course the next week, they have more children coming with more recycling because they feel encouraged themselves and then they encourage their parents to do it. And so it just, it just, you know, becomes a big thing. And by the end, we are the, um, the superheroes of recycling. We are all contributing. We have a huge box. So then we need a bigger one and everybody is just putting in um, their efforts um, to make this, to make this really happen. And so it, it's, um, it's amazing how it goes. And then at the end, by the end, when we are finished, when we have everything we need, we call the person that is in charge of this recycling. And we actually say to them, look, can you now come and show to the children what they can do with this bottle? And that person comes and says, okay, look at this. She presents, she says, you know, she explains a little bit how it goes, the process. And then she says, look, we have a chair and this has been made with these bottle tops. Or we have, um, um, I don't know, maybe, um, you know, those things that you put under the, the, the cups or the glasses, things like that. And the children hold that and they are just amazed by what they see. And it's very concrete and it means something to them. And that's how the process goes, basically. Yeah. It's lovely. It's a lovely sharing, demonstrating the importance of real experiences and actually seeing, um, you know, giving very uh, tangible evidence of what is possible when you all contribute to something like collecting lots of bottle tops. You will have, you will need to have thousands of bottle tops to make a chair, but uh, they have contributed to it. So lovely. Thank you very much indeed. Um, 
I hope that all three presentations gave you a feel of the importance of integrating some of these ideas across all areas of the curriculum. Um, some of you may be aware that in um, the recommended curriculum for the EYFS uh, in the document calls Birth to Five Matters in the area of knowledge and understanding of the world, we are encouraged to introduce um, care for the environment. We are encouraged to talk about global citizenship. We are encouraged to introduce ideas of sustainability. And so we now have an opportunity to break into little breakout rooms and explore how we could introduce sustainability into the curriculum and what we really need as teachers to make this more effective. So Wendelin will very kindly organize us into groups again. You can tick your box and then we will have little conversation for 15, 20 minutes. everybody for engaging in conversations and thank you for coming together. Um, I would like to invite our facilitators to share um, the conversations. Um, Wendy, would you like to start us off tonight? Um, it was really, really nice actually. We had lots of food for thought and we talked a lot about the care of the environment obviously in, in line with Montessori. Um, and Pamela had a lovely example of a little boy who went on a, on a trip to Whitstable and what he brought back from that trip with the parents had taken lots of photographs and the danger of plastic for the marine environment was absolutely, I think she had nearly a term's worth of work on the environment out of that, which was lovely. But what, we, what did come out was that we have to work with what we've got. So for example, Amina from Bosnia, everybody lives in apartments, so they can't, the, the children can't do as much as our children can. And um, Kate has a pack away nurse, pack sounds awful, a pack away nursery, but you know what I mean. And so that's quite frustrating for her because they have to pack everything away every day but she has managed to take a little bit of garden and she sent them all home with broad beans um, and then some of the children brought them back to plant. So there's lovely examples going on and you know we've just got to use what we've got um, and everybody appreciated the, um, 
the three um, presentations. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Suzanne. We had a very interesting discussion. We had Sarah Johnson, which was lovely. And we had Hannah in New York and we had another two from um, the UK and Lucy in Seychelles. So we had quite a, a, a different gathering. And yeah, it was quite interesting from Lucy shared her an experience that she did with her older children because obviously Seychelles on the main island being an island there is only so much space so they took the children to the landfill because obviously you know that's where everybody's waste goes and for the children to realize that they were driving in a minibus you know on top of all the waste that in the seven years that they were alive they had generated and in fact their nappies you know might still be in the ground beneath them. So that sort of sparked a conversation that the children then took home. Hannah also raised, you know, the idea of, from an adult's perspective, the carbon footprint that our Montessori materials have. You know, we have all these beautiful classrooms of materials and we know that they've flown however far and that they're not necessarily made of sustainable materials that are from that space. Is there anything that we could be doing to make the materials that we use in our environments more sustainable and also you know make them more durable I suppose um, Hannah gave the example of having seen materials that Montessori had in her classrooms and yet we can't seem to make materials last for more than a year or two um, when we buy them now um, Sarah Cummins also shared that you know getting the children involved was also Again, this is looking at the older children, the children um, writing letters to their parents, asking them, you know, to please not send, um, you know, things wrapped in plastic or helping the kitchen to reduce the use of plastic by coming up with different plans in terms of what they could be doing. We then also looked at how we would sow the seeds in the preschool, because a lot of these projects are run by the older children. Um, and Lucy also brought up something quite interesting, you know, looking at the consumables that we have in the classroom, like the metal insect, insect, insect papers. You know, if we keep replenishing and we replenish fast, then the children don't get to see that things do run out. And it's important for them to see that, you know, the paper runs out and to think about where the paper comes from and how they're going to make use of those resources. So, yeah, it was a lovely discussion in my group. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marianne. Okay, yeah, again, great discussion. We were lucky enough to have Lucy, who's been a practitioner for 32 years. She, she suggested the RHS. Um, schools for gardening which is a really good project but she I, I didn't know very much about it uh, but she said she really would recommend it and she ended up making apple sauce from the apples in the garden and sending them home and sharing them with parents. Um, Charlotte who works with Sarah in Norwich she was talking about the waste that we get at lunchtime. And I think that was something you said, Suzanne, you know, that, and, and they were thinking about, cause they want to be a waste-free nursery next year, uh, providing lots of cheese rather than, you know, those baby bells where you've got all the red wax every time and so much packaging and wasting. We're considering as a nursery having, you know, pro providing the parents with little Tupperware pots so that we don't get all those little yogurt pots that are flying around and, and, and need to be used. We reuse them. We use them for lots of different things, but it would be quite nice not to have that waste in the first place. And then Jennifer, who, who worked in Beijing, um, was talking about her experiences and she came up with a lovely idea what, that they'd done in their nursery where she asked, they asked the parents to provide things that the children could reuse or uh, reinvent um, um, and uh, asking the parents to have that suggestion. So they, some of them had brought in t-shirts that they made very simply into a bag so when the children got wet with water play, which invariably they do, that's 
one of the, the, the highlights of it, isn't it? Um, they would put the wet clothes into one of these t-shirts and the children would take them home. And it helped the parents to see that they're reusing the t-shirts for something very practical uh, and purposeful. So that really, um, we, we spoke a lot about a lot of other things and it was quite delightful hearing some of the ideas, but yeah, that was in a nutshell, tried to keep it tight. Thank you so much. And Heidi? Thank you, Barbara. Um, okay, so my group had Harima, who I think was also from Sarah's school, and then we had the three Michelles and myself. <laughs> so <laughs> I've written Michelle, but I don't remember which ones said what. Um, I think the advantage to being at the end is that most of what has been said, we had touched on a lot of, of the um, the comments from many of the other groups. One thing that our group did come up with, though, which was quite interesting in, in perhaps contrast to, I think, what Suzanne mentioned from Hannah, was that our environments, in fact, are quite, they're quite natural in their base. If you, if you think about um, our sensorial materials and potentially what we could be doing in our activities of everyday living and so on, um, and the Michelles in our in our group um, were in schools, and actually, I think actually even Karima mentioned how the materials, some of them in their schools are 20, 30, even up to 40 years old. Um, children coming into the schools whose parents had been in other schools and used the same material because it had been bought over, um, and how the material just potentially needs another coat of paint, and it's, you know, fine to to use again um so yeah that was quite nice that the children could then see and perhaps be told the story of you know where this pink tower came from or how long it's been in the you know in existence the story of the color tablets you know how they've been you know re revamped over time and i think that's i think i'm going to leave it there thank you so much um it's um so important to be reminded of the importance of us as role models and how we can show children how things can be repaired or renewed. Um, in our family, if something goes wrong, the grandchildren say, well, let's take it to Grumpy. He will know what to do and how to repair it. So he already has a role in the family as the repairer. Not all, doesn't always work, but he has got a role for that purpose. And I think uh, Lene, pointed that really beautifully in her presentation. And we also reflected on Shalisa's framework, which she uses uh, to introduce the projects, building on the children's awareness, and then uh, linking it to interconnectedness and into responsibility. I think it is a fantastic model through which to evaluate any of the projects that you um, you are introducing to the children because sometimes it's the children who bring the ideas, but some it really requires your um, curiosity to develop those um, noticing little things that the children notice. So it's very much about collab collaboration, very much about need for curiosity. And these are qualities which we are sharing with our younger children that hopefully they will take towards the elementary and secondary education where we are enabling them to have a voice. We are enabling them to think critically. We are giving them the tools through which they could potentially change the world as they go along. And I suppose that's one of the important outcomes of all the sustainability, not only caring for the uh, um, nature, but we don't know what the issues of sustainability will be in 20 years when the children of today are contributing towards the earth. Um, and in the same way as we are looking towards future, let's look towards tomorrow, I hope that tonight has brought, given you inspiration. It has given you food for thought. I hope that you will not only want to share it with the children, but also with your colleagues. And I hope you will go um, to Kavita's blog and think about the bigger issues 
which really should concern us about sustainability today. So thank you so much, everybody. We look forward to seeing you in a month's time when we will be exploring development and looking at the work of Vygotsky and Piaget and how it mirrors in our Montessori classrooms. So we see you in the middle of December. Have a good month and enjoy yourselves. Thank you. Thank you.